In Finland and Sweden, uh, and I think in Nordic countries, it's quite common when you have the sports. It's the voluntary organizations. I don't know the exact word in English, but it's the like ideal organization, non-profit organization, and it's really common to just just start these organizations for different sports or something else. And for example, uh, our club in Finland, it started with some guys who were working, for example, as a bouncers and uh, police and uh, they started just to like train together and try different things and then it became evolved to a club, official club and then they started to give trainings and uh, uh, it evolved to like if you have beginners courses and but, uh, it started from the like group of friends having having fun and trying things. Welcome to the Manifested Wobin podcast. I'm Leandro, your host. Today's guest is Venla Lukonen. Venla is the first and only Finnish Brazilian Jiu Jitsu black belt to win world championships. Even though she works full time as a primary school teacher, she manages to compete at the highest level of both Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and submission wrestling. She is currently living and training in northern Sweden. Venla, thank you very much for being here today. Thank you for having me. Uh, that's great to talk to you. And I'm very interested to know how you got interested in, in sports in the first place. Uh, I was always kind of active as a kid, like uh, outside and playing in the woods and like children did 35 years ago. And then I always had some kind of hobbies. Um, I did track and field and uh, uh, floorball, if, if it's just the English word, uh, and yeah. dancing, uh, modern dance and chess dance and a little bit of flamenco. And then I always also played some music. So it was music and sports, a lot of activities when I was a child. And then in the same time when I was in school and uh, uh, high school level, so both sports and music. Okay, so you you were born in Finland. Yeah. So you're to, you're talking about Finland. Yes. And and how how did you get interested in in martial arts? Uh, when I moved to study, I moved to another town. I was around twenty, and then I met some new friends, and we decided to try capoeira, which is kind of in between dance and martial art, also from Brazilian. Yeah. And uh, then in Capoeira, after like three years, there was some guy, uh, one guy who did also Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And he was sometimes showing us a little bit some moves. And then we were trying those and uh, yeah, did some kind of wrestling kind of things with him. And then few of us uh, just went to the beginner's class to try for real and then I started I was uh, 24 years old so quite okay. quite uh, old in a way but uh, true dancing <laughs> okay so uh, dancing and like capoeira so I, I ass I'm assuming now that between, between when you do capoeira we might have learned some not only sp to speak Portuguese or some Portuguese but also playing some music instruments is that correct yeah you have contact with music instruments what type of music instruments you you were in touch with or you practice uh, in capoeira there are the uh, brazilian traditional instruments and the main instrument yeah. is pirimbau which is uh, yeah it looks like a bow and there's a one string and you play with, with a stick but then i yeah. as i said i also uh, play did a lot of music when i was a child and my main instrument is saxophone which has nothing to do with capoeira, but uh, like in capoeira, I combined both sports and uh, dancing, a little bit theater and the musical side. So it was uh, a nice combination. Uh, yeah, so it's a nice combination as well, because when you have, you have body movements, you have music as well. So you are really connected to not only to your body you discover yeah. a body of movements and sounds and interacting with other people as well is that correct? yes and it's a lot of information and as you said it's interacting so 
you cannot do it by yourself. It's always uh, in capoeira. You say you play capoeira. You don't really fight. It's more like a playful thing. Of course, it can be harsh. You try to kick the other person, but it's also uh, playful and a little bit theatrical, like acting some kind of. You can have a role or different styles, and depending on the music, do you do different styles. So uh, you yeah you listen to music and then start to move with it and try to try to have fun. Ah, that's great. And and how come you you, you got to to the level of being the first black belt in Finland, the Finnish black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu? How how was your how how did your journey start after discovering with this friend that introduced you? Then how did you manage to practice? I, I assume that it was it in Finland. Right? Yeah. You start. Yeah. Correct. It was in Finland okay. in Uvascula. Uh Two years in the beginning, I just had it as another hobby. So I did capoeira. I did a few times a week, like two, three times a week jujitsu. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I started competing a little bit, but not really on the serious level. But I, I thought that was also fun. And uh, then I went to my first Europeans as a blue belt, uh, 2010, and that was my first bigger competition, like on an international level. And then I won my own category and became second in the Open. And I think uh, from there I started to yeah, put more effort in the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. And then uh, I tried to do capoeira at the same time, and it was hard to keep both of them when the when I started to train more jiu-jitsu. So the body couldn't, uh, or the time was harder to manage to both uh, to go both to capoeira and jiu-jitsu. So I kind of um, I like the competing part. Yes, mm -hmm. but this this when you said that when you have to decide between one and the other, mm -hmm. was it a, an issue with time? that you had to be to focus more hours in one specific sport than the other was because of interest, mainly interest? Uh, I think a little bit of both because mm. I decided I want to use my time more to Jiu-Jitsu. I had done Kapoor uh, around four or five years and I started, uh, I think I found new things in Jiu-Jitsu that I enjoyed. And then at the same time, um, we started to build, um, you cannot really say women's team, but promote the Brazilian Institute for Women more in Uvascula and me and uh, my nowadays coach and also wife, Hanna Hirvonen. We started to uh, yeah, put a lot of time to improve the sports both for ourselves and then for the other women there. Of course, we trained also with the guys, but uh, it helped us both to uh, yeah, get better all the time. And then she has been my main, main, main uh, training partner from 2010 and forward. So I think that's also a big reason that I have been ev evolving that fast and got to the highest level because I always had a partner like also hope that we can go to the trainings together and she's really good in planning what we are going to do and how we're going to train and so um, it's always good because you you will always have a training partner yeah that's amazing yeah that's good and so you say you said that there is a, would you say that there's a interest or a big interest in martial arts in, in, in grappling brazilian jiu-jitsu uh, in, in Finland or Sweden, mostly females? Is something that the females, they're interested uh, in, in this type of sports? It's a vim, uh, women are still minority. And, uh, still minority, Yeah, okay. I think uh, when I started, we were two women uh, at the beginner's class, and then we were probably four women in the whole club. Mm -hmm. So the meaning we started to have uh, trainings only for girls, to get more women in the sports. And uh, it's still like, yeah, maybe 10% only. 
uh, of the people who are trading are women, but it's growing all the time. And I think also the female athletes are nowadays getting more attention. And I think that also motivates people today to start. There are a lot more women now competing and training than when I started. So the interest mm. is, uh, it's growing. That's good. And what, what does it make so attractive? Why is Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu attractive uh, for you, for uh, instance? For me, uh, it's, it's because it's the whole body involved. And then the, also the fighting element that you, it's, uh, it was the same in Capoeira in a way that you had to react to the other person uh, movement. And also sometimes in dancing, but you're not doing that by yourself. So it's the body and also the mind, which has to be there all the time. Uh, yeah, because you kind of try to win the other person all the time and it's not meaning to hurt someone, but you try to get the, they to yeah, give up to get the submission. So it's a boat train for the mind and for body. And uh, yes. But Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu has this, as you said, this participatory element, you know, because yeah. is even if you have the, your set of techniques and everything, there must be a high, high level of improvisation as yeah. well and be able to think very fast. Yes, I can never control the other person that I, I can decide what she or he is going to do. I can only decide what I'm going to do, so I have to react a lot. And that's, that was also with capoeira, that it's, it's a kind of discussion all the time, that you have to react to the other person's movement as well. And this, do you think that this element is, is somehow related to, to dance, or there's some kind of similarity of yeah. this particip participatory element of... Yeah. Of course there are dance, but you are doing like by yourself, yeah. But uh, many dances, you also react to the other person or other persons uh, when you do the choreographies. And uh, maybe in dance, it's more, if it's not improvised, then it's more controlled. You have the choreography and then you know the moments in beforehand. But there can also be improv improvisation involved. So I like the doing with my whole body <laughs> part. Uh, that's it. it's there and it's challenging oh, that you, you, you learn every day something <laughs> what's what's this challenging about it uh, I think you never get that good that you are uh, the level you get it's getting higher all the time but you're never that good that you can think it now I know everything and I can stop so like yesterday I was in uh, Stockholm in a seminar and mm. of course after many years you start to know kind of all the principles in uh, in the sport and still you manage to uh, learn new new details and get the new re really nice uh, things to your game or you you realize that ah this is the piece I missed there and after many years it's still like surprises and what what are the challenges you face when you encounter in training or in keeping up with your schedule? Make sure uh, that you train enough. Yeah, nowadays uh, when I started, I was still studying, uh, so it was a little bit easier to train more. Uh, but now when I work, the time is always a challenge. So how to find time for my own training? Uh, our club is kind of small in uh, Sweden and in Finland. It's the same principle. Most of the clubs are working on a voluntary basis. So when you are a higher belt, you also give classes. Uh, no one gets paid. There are many instructors. Yeah. So for example, nowadays, me and my wife, we give two trainings per week. And that's the trainings we give. We cannot really train our own stuff. Of course, we try to get the things we want to train as well into the trainings, but then you are concentrating in teaching. So that leaves you like five days after those two days and still you have to have time to rest 
also after the working or studying. So uh, uh, yeah, we have we have find kind of uh, solution for our our uh, everyday life. And like I said in the beginning, it's really easy because we are two of us, so we can always plan together. Uh, today we have time to train at uh, six o'clock, so we can go and we always have a training partner. Then we try to get other people as well with us, but at least we are two of us always. So it, it makes it a little bit easier. But, uh, yeah, time. Yeah. <laughs> time, so yeah. it would be time. And how about injuries? How do you deal or if you, you, you have had any injuries, anything significant or you're just fine? Uh, training hard? We, we have been taking, <laughs> we try to prevent the injuries. That's the first rule. Yeah. So uh, that's taking a lot of time of the training as well that we, we try to all the time think how we can uh, protect the body. And for example, warm-ups. Uh, uh, we really believe that you have to always warm up. But it's a little bit funny that in Brazil, really to, the culture is sometimes that you don't really do specific warm-ups. You just try to roll. And for my body, I cannot do that. I, it hurts. So I really have to warm up uh, the whole body. And we do a lot of dynamic stretching and that kind of thing. Sometimes yoga or something before the class. Uh, it's a contact sport, so uh, I believe that you have to warm up your body and prepare it. Yes. Yes. Like when I go to for swimming, I see the swimmers; they warm up before they start to swim, and it's it's not a contact sport. So I think it's really important. And uh, uh, then I think it's also the mind, which is which can be a pre. <laughs> uh, helping you because you can still train hard, but smart. Uh, I have had only like one major injury and that was in the competition and it came like, it was an accident. It, it wasn't, it just happened. I tore one ligament in my knee and not uh, totally, but a little bit. So then I had like three months break, but that's the only injury, like bigger injury during the 11 years I've been doing this sport. So I think the preven prevention has worked <laughs> quite well. Of course, accidents can happen. It's not that, but it's really preparing your body to hold up as long as possible. Tell me about your, because you comment that you have a schedule where you, when you train your team or mm -hmm. gym or club, you work on a voluntary basis. How, how, how did this system develop? Uh, the whole system or? Yeah, let's say, how, how, how did you guys come about, okay, we have this, let's put together gym and each one will give one or two lessons. Yeah. How, what, what, what was the necessity, yeah. the need? How did it come the need and then? Yeah, because we, we the haven't been here and started anything. I think it's the, in Finland and Sweden, uh, and I think in Nordic countries, it's quite common when you have the sports. It's the voluntary organizations. I don't know the exact word in English, but mm -hmm. it's the like mm -hmm. ideal organization, non-profit organization. And it's really common to just, just start these organizations for different sports or something else. And for example, uh, our club in Finland, it started with some guys who were working, for example, as a bouncers and uh, police. And uh, they started just to like train together and try different things. And then it became evolved to a club, official club. And then they start to give uh, trainings and uh, uh, it evolved to like, uh, if you have beginners courses and but, uh, it started from the like group of friends having having fun and trying things but it's a really traditional way in in uh, scandinavia to start start a yeah club okay if you if, let's say that it's it's not the unusual that if you have any skill like you know a martial arts you on your community you will, would open your doors your garage and say okay let's do some, some 
lessons or something once a week or yeah. any time I could. And this could grow to become a club and people coming and getting together to, yeah. to train together. And I see it, of course, mm. when you are in the bigger city, like now I live in Örebro in Sweden, which is like uh, 140,000 people. It's a bigger city in Sweden, so it's quite many people who are interested. But then you see some people come here on a train and then they move back to some little uh, town in the middle of Sweden. And normally it's some, those kind of people who start a club there. For example, here, one hour away, there's a town with only, I don't know, less than 10,000 people and they have a BJJ club there. Because there are people who have been training somewhere else and then moved there and started the club. So it's it's a common thing in <laughs> in Scandinavia. Yeah, that's very interesting because this this would be uh, would break the whole concept that you need a specific teacher to stay with this person for, for, for ten years, otherwise it wouldn't happen. So you actually can develop by yourself yeah. and, 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 and and compete at the highest level even though you you don't follow this yeah, no, system. Of course, the, it helps if you have a, a coach. And nowadays, when the sport has yeah, uh, more people there, you stress to have the people who are at the club. And there are a few commercial clubs as well in Sweden and Finland. But still, I think most of the people learn uh, learn they first jiu-jitsu or MMA or submission wrestling in a like voluntary basis club mm. and for me it has been really yeah, I have been lucky to have uh, my wife Hanna with me because she's really into the coaching as well so we have been coaching each other and training with each other but we, we don't have some one master who comes and tells us what to do, but we have planned our own channel. And then we try to, uh, well, if we see that, okay, now we want to learn some new stuff, we maybe go to a seminar or try to look from competition what the other people are doing. And we have a really good wrestling coach at the club. So once a week we go to wrestling, which is really nice. Then you, you don't have to think yourself. Someone else has done the training. But uh, most of the people at our club, they, it's the jiu-jitsu, it's hobby for them. So they come uh, twice, three, three times a week, and then they go home and do other stuff. So it's it's not so common, but it's possible to do it possible. like this. It's very, yeah. yeah, it's very very interesting and encouraging as well. Like to think about okay, now you don't have you don't have actually to wait for someone or even to move to another city as long as there's this first person with uh, uh, enough knowledge to share and then you can mm -hmm. develop it as you have as you have uh, internet and there are lots of information yeah. available so mm -hmm. if you are able to understand the information break it down and transmit it yeah, yeah it's, it's interesting. Let me ask you something, because this would raise the whole question of grading and how can someone deal in a situation that, okay, the, the first people, like how the first people get graded, that these grades can be recognized to, for you to go and compete into, like for IBJJF and, you know, all these, these federations. You think uh, about the belts or...? Yeah, yeah. How, how, uh, in your case, how did you deal with with grading yeah. and yeah, because throughout the years? In uh, when I started, there was only one black belt in Finland, and yeah. he 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 didn't give the belts. But uh, the Finnish clubs had uh, different clubs had different cooperations with different black belts from different countries. For example. Our club in Finland, Uvascula Fight Club, uh, has cooperation with the Hilti BJJ team, which cooperates with uh, Pedro Duarte. And in the beginning, he was the guy who came to Finland and gave the black belts. But before that, in the inside the team, I have got my belts from different people, and they have always been the people who are near me either training at Juvascula or then uh, in other Hilti clubs. 
Uh, so the instructor, <laughs> they speak with each other and then when there's somebody who can give the bells comes comes and gives a seminar or something, they talk to that person and then you then you can get the belt. And nowadays there are more than 100 black belts in Finland and I think there are more in Sweden as well. So it's getting easier. But in the beginning, you, you waited that someone comes there and then you make those relations to, oh, to yeah. other persons. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's mm. interesting. Yes. And how, uh, what are your plans for, for now, next month, next few months, in terms of competitions, uh, what you're preparing for? For the bigger competitions, uh, it's always the spring, the Europeans and the World Championships. And mm. I have been checking, there are different IBHHAF and other organizations having now competitions during the autumn, but I still am uh, waiting some answers about some super fights. So when I know the dates, I can plan the calendar a little bit easier. But okay, so you, I have you some. Would have... Oh, that's our cat. <laughs> um... Yeah, you would have to explain to our viewers what a super fight is. Uh, like normally, you fight in a tournament, and then you yeah. do like in other martial arts. You meet someone, and then the winner goes uh, to the next fight and next fight, and then you get the cold. But the... nowadays, you can also have uh, super fights which is kind of like in boxing or MMA, that you will agree with the organization that, okay, I will fight against some person that I know in beforehand. There might be different rules. It might be a little bit longer time. And then it's, it's for the public. It's also for the show that uh, it's more like, a, like an MMA or boxing gala. Uh, that you, you have the public just to see this one match and it's entertainment well, also. <laughs> yeah, what, what's the best thing about super fights? Best thing? Yeah, yeah. for you. Uh, especially because it's quite often uh, the rules are submission only. In the mm -hmm. tournaments you go for points as well. And I have always been uh, that kind of player that I secured the points first. It has been my style. And uh, then when the super fight has started to come more and more common, yeah. uh, I have been, uh, uh, I had to change my style. So I had to develop uh, more towards the submission and also think that as an entertainment. Like uh, I said in the beginning that I have been doing music uh, and playing the saxophone. And that was the main thing from I was 10 years old until I was 20 years old. I, we did a lot of concerts and shows, and it's kind of the same thing to have this show kind of element in the sport as well. So you had to develop your style, and that's that has been interesting for me. It gives uh, another kind of motivation. Great, that's great. Tell me something. Um, if you could tell us about your training, let's say a training routine for a pre pre fight and post, like uh, how do you train like on and off season? Uh, let's say uh, normally we yeah before the season we check which competitions are the main competitions. So for example, now during the last spring, it was the Europeans in IBHHF then the ADCC, European Trials, and the Worlds. So there were three bigger competitions. And then we always think that maybe there's some smaller competition coming, but that's not the main competition, so we don't really change the training towards those. But mm -hmm. we, we choose one, two, maximum three competitions, which are the most important. And mostly, like, uh, when it's still a long time, under the competition, then the, we try to do uh, longer rounds, uh, try to concentrate on the weakness, which we have uh, noticed during the past competitions, and uh, maybe also do like what we call uh, pad positions, that you really start from a really bad position and try to come out and then, <laughs> yeah, come to a better position. And uh, we do a lot of drilling and specific sparring 
so that we start from a certain position and then one or two things we try to do that we don't do the whole sparring whole match and then when the competitions come nearer we start to concentrate on the like the uh how do you say not the weaknesses but your strengths yeah sometimes the swedish language is taking my english uh so you concentrate to the strengths and then the rounds the sparring rounds they become more intensive but also shorter that you really have the uh, focus all the time and you concentrate that now during this two minutes i'm full focusing on winning this round and then i have a little break and then i'm focusing again for two minutes and we try to get the pace up as well so a little bit yeah shorter rounds and still it's specific sparring starting from different positions but now concentrating on attacks and strengths mostly and in this case would you have would you train with more training partners or you have like a different training partners that you could have access to and spend um, spend doing sparring sessions it depends uh, we have a small club and Hanna is my main partner so at least it's always her then we have a few others who are also doing more competitions um, so we try to get everybody who are interested to the trainings and we have we always say that everybody who wants to come to the trainings which we are have planned to ourselves they are welcome so there might be guys and girls who train once a week but they want to come that day to the club and then we train but uh, one challenge is to find uh, variation and especially other women uh, in a high level to train with that Hanna is not in the same weight class with me and she's really good training partner but it would be really useful for me to travel a bit and train with the bigger girls because they are the opponents in my own weight category but time again it's a it's a challenge and sometimes we manage to get some other people to train with sometimes not but uh, we do with these resources and uh, we try to do the best things we can with the resources we have and not be not complain too much that uh, we cannot do this and cannot do that but we do what we can and do that as well as we can uh, that's great mm -hmm. and tell me tell me something uh, anything that you would like to share uh, if someone wants to get in touch with you if you do like workshops or seminars yeah uh, we, I do, and then we do a lot of seminar together with Hanna. So I think it's always better to take both of us because that's also the way we learn best. And uh, you find us in Facebook, for example, in the social media, uh, in Instagram, uh, Twitter. So it's just to send a message. It's uh, relatively easy nowadays in the BJJ community to find find people. So. We are really happy to come when we have the time and we find the right weekend. So we we really like to teach as well. That's good. And you you, you have experience teaching because you're you're a school teacher. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. I'm a primary school teacher. So then it's maths and science and other stuff. But uh, like uh, teaching is my uh, yeah profession as well. Do you teach sports as well to, to the um, kids, or mostly math and science? Uh, in it's a little bit different in Finland when you are becoming a primary school teacher. You have all the subjects in from the like until the sixth grade until the students get twelve years old. In Sweden, uh, it depends on the year. Here it's more like uh, it's uh, chapters. Do you have in your uh, uh, how do you say, which chapter you have studied to become a teacher in. And uh, next year I'm going to have maths, science, uh, arts, and I'm going to be also in sports, but not that much. So I can be a sports teacher, but I'm not sports yeah. teacher every year or so. It varies. Or, if, or, or, if, or even music as well, because you, 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 yeah, have, I can be, you played saxophone, or you could play... Uh, teach musicals, which is very versatile. 
Yeah, it's, it's, uh, I think that was one of the reasons I studied to become a teacher, that you can uh, work with different things, not just with one, one subject. That's great. I would like to, to before finishing, ask you a few uh, rapid-fire questions. Are you ready? Yeah. What is your favorite book? Uh, I think uh, Robin Hobb. In English, I think it's called the Farseer Trilogy. Yes. Uh, if so. Why? Why do you like it? Uh, I like uh, fantasy stories and science fiction. So uh, that was one of my first books. I. I uh, or the series I read from him, and I like the story uh, of the assassin uh, guy who, uh, yeah, it's an interesting story. I, I like the fantasy. What's your favorite movie? Uh, Kill Bill. By... Why? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I like the story there. Uh, I'm not really violent or that kind of person by myself but the strong female character and it's a nice dialogue as well and you like films of, by, by quentin tarantino yeah as, as a rule would you like this director yeah i really like his films so i think the pulp fiction was the first one i saw when i was 15 or 16 or something like that. How was it? What, what was your impression, if you remember your impression? I remember that I was at my cousin's place uh, visiting him. And then it was like middle of the night. We were thinking what we are going to do. And he had these uh, videos. So I get to choose one video we should would watch middle of the night. And I didn't know about Tarantino before that. I just thought that uh, we'll take this. And yeah, it, I was 15, 16, so it was really uh, a great experience. I think it was also like uh, exciting film, middle of the night, uh, being uh, visiting your cousin. So it, it was kind of fun night. Great. Mm. Uh, what's your favorite hobby? I still consider Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu as my hobby, <laughs> so right. that that should be my favorite hobby. And I think nowadays I don't do that much. Uh, otherwise, I will. I'm home or like maybe playing Pokemon Go. <laughs> That's relaxing sometimes. Right. Um, an inspirational person for you? Uh, my mother. Uh, she passed away when I was twenty. Uh, because of cancer, uh, but she was always really strong and independent and uh, like woman of principles. So I, I look, looked up to her and now when I'm becoming older, I think I hopefully uh, become like similar person. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh. A place you would like to visit? Mm, Iceland. I'm being there once in Reykjavik, but I would like to go like to the other places as well because of nature. I think it looks awesome in the pictures. So. How about nature in Finland and Sweden? There, I I I have never been there. There, there must be uh, lots of forests as well. Yeah, forests yeah. and uh, especially in Finland lakes. So uh, yeah. even though I've been always living in kind of big city, if you think uh, it's not big cities, maybe for people who live in America or in England or so, it's 100,000 uh, people. But uh, the nature is here. You don't have to go and uh, try many hours, but you live next to the nature so it's a really nice uh, way to relax also just to, like go outside and then you can go to the forest you don't have to drive somewhere or it, it it's enough to go and you'll find the nature that's good that's good so so here i am i assume also that in your childhood you you were you were in touch with nature yeah that have 
easy access. You yes. had easy access, even, uh, even, even living in the city. Yeah, we had a big forest, like uh, behind the house we were living. It was a house with apartments, but it has a forest. We had a football field there outside, and it was quite common to go and just ask your other people living in the house, that, do you want to go and play in the forest or something? So nature is a big, <laughs> big thing here. And to finish, a meaningful life for me is? Um, uh, I, I thought this <laughs> quite a long time. I think it's uh, like enjoy and evolve <laughs> at the same time. But uh, it's uh, really important to try to improve, try to learn more, try to get better, but also to enjoy the things you do. Um, uh, um, uh, also the like the normal life everyday life and also enjoy the achievement that it's not only like to evolve to some kind of dream which is in the future but uh, yeah enjoy the about the achievements you have already done in your life amazing Bela, thank you very much for your time no, thank Appreciate you it.